So I wanted to begin with a brief discussion of the nature of and the implications of these international corporate consultancies, uh, whether military and paramilitary and counterinsurgency training or corporate interventions in the field of public relations. Uh, in terms of perpetrating, reframing and denying atrocity, the state has many partners available for hire. Sometimes these corporations operate under great secrecy, um, and sometimes they operate in a very mundane and unquestioned manner. Phil's report demonstrates that state corporate and state corporate military connections can often be very explicit once you know where to look and what to look for. The important point to make, I think, is that these corporations carry weight in terms of actually providing muscle and training to oppressive forces, as well as discursively framing conflict. So they alter conflict in particular ways, both within institutions like the military and the state structure, and within society itself. They carry ideology and discourses that operate to normalise atrocity as necessary counter-terrorism, uh, keeping us safe, and of course they benefit financially in the process. So the informal economies thrown up by war and resistance struggles are both domestic and international. We often hear a lot about local smugglers and opportunistic traders who are vilified and condemned for perpetuating conflict. We hear a lot less about the international transfer of skills and resources from military to military and in a private capacity that Phil talks about in his report. So during the war and after in Sri Lanka, um, the underground economy is related to the deep structure of militarization that has taken root. So this relates not only to the actual deployment of soldiers and the arms trade, but also to what Uyen calls a wide variety of constituencies and characters, uh, politicians and political parties, traders and entrepreneurs, military and guerrilla groups active in the conflict itself. So a hidden economy operates under the structure of the overarching military structure. Uh, so consisting, this consists of explicit and recognisable actors such as arms dealers and paramilitaries, as well as businessmen and women who profit from war. I want to briefly refer to the involvement of the mainstream corporate sector as well, uh, which Malufa de Mel, uh, her study on militarisation in Sri Lanka, does brilliantly. For these actors, a political solution to the conflict did not carry much influence. Uh, the trade in arms, transport, military supplies and other military-related activities was intertwined with advertising and sponsorships of banks, motor companies and other businesses. These businesses supported the discourse of military necessity throughout the war and that militarisation of discourse was available for the Rajapaksa government to appropriate in order to defeat the LTT militarily and to justify mass atrocities against civilians. So the militarization of society and the capitalist economy were very much codependent. One other point I wanted to make before introducing our speakers uh, is about the influence of the so-called war on terror in Sri Lanka, particularly in the war's final phase. So the acceptable framework within which a state can wage war these days is largely one that draws legit legitimacy from the global war on terror launched by the US in the post 9 11 phase. Within this framework, conflict and enormous violence are justifiable in the pursuit of the destruction of terrorists or the name of humanitarianism, a military effort to rescue civilian populations from rogue states or from terrorists. So a great deal of international legitimacy was sought by countries dealing with insurgencies uh, by aligning themselves <coughs> with the war on terror. It just destabilised the nebulous and primarily state-drawn boundary distinguishing non-state armed, armed actors engaging in a liberation str struggle from terrorists that challenge the state's position as guardian of law and order. So the war on terror has increased flows of material, legal and technological support to such states. The war on terror has served to consolidate the role and legitimacy of the latent state and to remake the global political order. So when we consider the legitimating discourse of the war on terror with Phil's report in mind, uh, we should think about how global paradigms open up opportunities for commercial relationships and exchange. Largely how global governance offers a framework of understanding by which assistance can be provided to states or allies. Uh, we might also think about how terms such as counterinsurgency, assistance, peace building and security form, which are so common in discourse on diplomacy and transitional justice, uh, conceal a logic of stabilisation and securitisation. 
So, um, so as well to, rather than just focusing on economic exchange and the exchange of resources as well, um, going back to the 1970s, the UK also had a role in defining and influencing Sri Lanka's domestic narrative of counter-terror. Uh, this is a long-standing and important point to make um, about the shape of the transfer or export of legal interpretations. So the terrorist labor that label um, applied to the LGT has been a central feature of political discourse in Sri Lanka since the rise of militant groups in the 70s. This label was applied irrespective of the scale of violence um, or a violent challenge to the state. And despite the political development of Tamil separatism, terrorism as a conceptual framework was immediately applied to Tamil groups. And making the point to try to link the UK and Sri Lanka in this way, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, or the PTA of 1978, was modelled on the British Prevention of, Te Prevention of Terrorism Act of 1974. And the Sri Lankan state and lawmakers also drew inspiration from anti-terrorism laws in Israel. So the, the language of terrorism was embedded and institutionalised in this official definition um, of the PTA. So I just mentioned this to emphasise that practices of counterinsurgency uh, defined and crafted in the UK are transferred by a variety of means, uh, training, technology, legal measures and discourse carried by corporations and international institutions. So at that, I'll introduce the panel. Um, so Bhattana Abuwardana is a journalist and political activist living in exile from Sri Lanka. He was a young member of the JVP and survived the state's brutal repression of the JVP uprising in the late, late 80s. Bhattana was the founder and later editor-in-chief of the alternative nuclear newspaper, Hiru, in Sri Lanka. Um, and he has consistently worked to build alliances between the Tamils and Sindhis masses. As a result of his critical newspaper columns, he faced threats of violence and was forced to exile. But he continues to publish ver in various online journals and is currently coordinator of Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka, an organisation founded by Sri Lankan journalists in exile. Uh, and Dr. Abdul Tikriti is a lecturer in international history at the University of Sheffield. He previously held a junior research fellowship in political history at Oxford. Dr. Tikriti received various awards for his doctoral thesis, and his book, Monsoon Revolution, Republican Sultans and Empires in Oman, 1965-76, was a finalist for the 2013 Royal Historical Society's Gladstone Prize. He is currently co-authoring with Professor Carmen Nabrosi, a book on the Palestinian Revolution. So at that, I'll ask Dr. Tukriti to take over. Thank you very much.